हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू लाइ एक्सलेंस वेलकम टू अवर नाइनटीन वीकली मैगजीन वेर विल बी कवरिंग फ्रॉम सेकेंड जुलाई टू एट जुलाई टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन सो क्विकली लेट एस सी वॉट आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट इश्यूज दैट आर देयर इन दिस वीक द एस एफ द वीक इज रेड्यूसिंग इन इक्वालिटीज विद इन एंड अमोंग कंट्रीज इन नेसेसरी टू अचीव सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट एज आई हैव टोल्ड यू UPSC has not asked you any question with respect to sustainable development it's very very important for you to collect information about sustainable development and talk how exactly this can be implemented now this question can also be changed where i will change countries to states reducing inequalities and within and among states is necessary to achieve sustainable development in india so you should be prepared for any of that changes which can be made with respect to sustainable development so there are list of areas that you always have to focus when it comes to essay so if you have these points you can use it for any essay whether it is child development whether it is infant mortality rate whether it is maternal mortality rate or when we are talking about education right in almost all these factors we need to bring in these aspects as much as possible so my request to you is just try to ensure that highlight certain points or certain issues which are in news and some common issues which we regularly see and try to read or collect points for those specific essays that will be beneficial for you next from geography point of view if we see for the first time we have got some evidence clearly stating that climate change has actually led to steady decline of sundarbans we know that sundarbans is a mangrove plantation which is actually present near west bengal and bangladesh closer to bay of bengal and when we are talking about mangroves we are actually seeing that there can be mangroves which are there closer to the fresh water and there are mangroves which are closer to the sea for example if i consider this to be the border of sea right border of india this is sea and this is land and if a fresh water is actually coming in there will be mangroves growing throughout right mangroves which are closer to the sea if we observe they are more saline loving mangroves and which are farther or closer to the fresh water or fresh water loving mangroves so within mangroves also you can see different species based on the length of the forest cover now we have observed that wherever the fresh water is actually flowing there some sort of sedimentation usually happens okay so that is if i say a fresh water is actually flowing into the sea you have some sort of sedimentation usually taking place and when the sedimentation is there sea water whenever it comes it tries to erode some sort of sediments so i'm try i'm trying to tell you a simple concept that is rivers whenever they enter into the ocean at the mouth of the sea you usually observe sedimentation taking place correct and during tides or the sea waves usually try to remove or erode some of these sediments so if at all there is sediments and if the ocean is removing these sediments there will be balance between these two and the mangroves will have enough sediments to grow but now what is happening because of climate change we are usually observing that water level has actually declined in these rivers so fresh waters are actually getting less sediments or actually bringing less sediments when these fresh waters are getting less sediments 
and ocean water is still eroding the same amount of sediments that it used to do before as well. So here more erosion is happening whereas deposition of sediments is not at all happening. This is a major problem which we are actually observing in the mangroves area especially in Sundarbans. I hope you are getting the point. Earlier we said that there was equal amount of sedimentation and also erosion taking place but now we observe that sedimentation has reduced but erosion is still continuing and due to this we are usually observing that the Sundarbans are in threat. The second logic what people say is maybe because the ocean water level has increased and when the ocean water level is increasing even though sedimentation is taking place let me take another scenario that the fresh water is still getting the sediments correct but the sea water level has actually increased when the sea water level increases erosion increases so two concepts one either sedimentation has decreased and erosion has increased second sedimentation is same but erosion has increased so these two things are actually leading to decrease in sedimentation level in the Sundarbans area and this has really affected the mangrove growth this is what the climate change impact on Sundarbans actually are. So in mains the question will be what is the impact or concerns associated with this depletion of mangroves. So the first important thing is a critical minimal inflow of fresh water is necessary for the luxuriant growth of mangroves and if this doesn't happen then there will be change in mangrove succession. This is from ecology point of view, right? Where we are saying that the fresh water loving species of mangroves will be replaced by salt water loving ones. The immediate impact of this will be with respect to fishes where the commercially sought fish pieces may be replaced by the fish which does not have much market value. So this is the economic aspect. It poses a serious threat to carbon sequestration potential and other ecosystem which are dependent on mangrove forest cover in future. So this we are talking from the climate change point of view. There's one more point which you have to add with respect to disaster management. It is believed that the mangroves wherever they are present they act as a shield against the cyclones or if there is any tides, tsunamis or anything which affect the coastal regions if mangrove cover is there it is believed that it will have good impact to reduce the effect of the cyclones on the coastal areas as well. So this is very very important for us to focus. Right? So both from prelims and mains, Sundarbans is important. Please go through it quickly. Recently, when Prime Minister Modi visited Israel, there was a celebration or opening of Haifa port city, which is very very important, mainly because during the First World War, Indian soldiers, especially from Jodhpur, along with Mysore lancers and others through their cavalry had actually occupied this particular territory. And when Modi visited Israel, this was actually opened and there was celebrations of this as well. Every year Indian army celebrates on 23rd September, Haifa Day and this with the formal opening at Haifa has again recognized the role of Indian soldiers in First World War. Least possibility they may ask you a question in mains but in prelims they may ask you where exactly is Haifa present. So right. So just 
you just need to know about this particular fact. The next important issue is actually with respect to your report released by World Bank. One in prelims, they may directly ask you World Development Report is launched by whom? It is by World Bank. And the second important thing, if you can use this in your essay or in mains answer writing, it would be helpful. So let us see what exactly the report talks about. Earlier, the report used to talk mostly about economic freedoms. But today, the report is actually focusing on removing the constraints for freedom. If these unfreedoms or constraints for freedom is removed, then only actual goal can be achieved by the people. Right? So you have to say that it is not only economic freedom being given to people, but we should also ensure that the constraints to enjoy the freedom should also be removed to see a successful democracy evolving or successful governance structure evolving. Along with this, we have also spoken about development issues. Governance shall deliver the goals of security, growth, and equity achieved in ecologically sustainable ways. When we talk about security, according to United Nations Development Program, not with respect to internal security aspects where we talk about fear of threat. Here, security means freedom from wants also. Here, World Bank, United Nations, all these organizations believe that security means freedom from threat and also freedom from wants. There are more number of people in the world dying because of poverty, health issues, and there are more number of people they are dying because of climate change and other associated factors. Not only the militant factors is what they talk about. And at the same time, they say whenever you are focusing on development, ensure that it has to be ecologically sustainable. And when I say equity, equity means it should treat developed countries and developing countries and least developed countries differently. And when I am talking about equity within the country, rich and poor division has to be reduced. So all these things has to be considered. The report also emphasizes on democratization process as a need for development. They say that when we take the case of Africa, earlier there was either two party system or single party democracy, where only one party will be contesting elections and all other parties will be usually just looking at what the process are happening or for namesake they were present. But now, with democracy deepening in these African countries, wherever multi-party democracy is seen, so the other political parties are pressurizing the government to take up some of the important issues. Even in India, we see when we talk about multiculturalism, when you have multiple parties, each party will take the issue of that particular community and that will have its representation. Similarly, in Africa, whenever you have multi-party democracies, we are usually identifying that issues like infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate have been addressed by different political parties and they are pressurizing the government to look into these issues and this has led to reduction in infant mortality rate. So if you want to talk about sustainable development goals, you can also say that whenever we focus on democratization and multi-party democracy, even these issues can be brought and they will be addressed properly by the governments. Development also shall challenge the interests of power holders that control institutions. Right? Whenever there is development, then the people will be empowered to challenge the institutions having power. At last, this will have greater emphasis on gender rights and equity. So common things, but if you can add them in your essays, it will fetch you more marks. Supreme Court has recently directed to the center that 
ensure a transparent election commission officers appointment we are all aware that according to the constitution there is no determined procedure and it says it is left to the parliament to decide till now one of the beauty of our democracy is even though there is no qualification no selection procedure established whoever came to that position have maintained absolute neutrality and they have ensured some sort of confidence in the election system supreme court also acknowledged this point they said that yes till now this incident has not happened but it is fair on the people's point to ask to have a transparent system where the selection process is not biased till now the prime minister and his council of ministers usually say pick a name and that will be appointed or that will be accepted by the president but now they are saying that there should be some selection procedure a committee has to be set up and it has to take care of this so whenever you are talking about this you can give example of turkunde committee recommendations where they said you should have a panel consisting of prime minister leader of opposition and the cji these three have to come together and decide who should be the election commissioner always remember guys whenever you need to put your point where you want to say that some modifications has to be done then please try to see if there was any report or committee set up on this issue and did they make any recommendations at any point of time so once if that information is clear for you it will be easy for you to talk about this issue right so please ensure that you are looking into this aspect the next important issue is actually with respect to protecting prisoners where you might have heard about some human rights violation and also there is some problem to the fundamental rights to the prisoners so rather than looking into the issues it is important for us to see what should be the model police reforms that are actually required to secure the rights of prisoners for this let us see what exactly a model law talks about the model jail manual talks about free legal services which is actually provided under article 39a of the constitution then additional provisions for the women which are actually given by united nation general assembly rights of prisoners sentenced to death you should ensure that their human rights is protected modernization and prison computerization so that the prisoners may also use technology or software not to escape or not to do crime but to develop their skills as well focus on after care services that is what should be done for rehabilitation of these released convicts then provisions for children of women prisoners to ensure holistic development of children of women prisoners organizational uniformity and increase focus on prison correctional staff it is very very important inspection of prisons regularly to ensure that if there is any deficiencies appropriate action is taken care the next important issue is modi's visit to israel whenever we spoke about any of the international relations i have never given the background information of that particular country because mostly with all these countries you know that the relationship is either associated with agriculture or it is associated with climate change terrorism some common points india's relationship with israel has its own uniqueness so let us see what exactly is india's relationship with israel jews who were present across europe united states and other countries during 1850s to 
they realize that there is some sort of anti-Semitism. When we say Semitism or Semitic, Semitic languages are either Arabic or Hebrew. Jews speak Hebrew language. Now, there was some sort of anti-Semitism growing in Europe. And this made Jews to think that, yes, we need to have a separate country of our own. And what Jews did, they actually focused on the most powerful country at that time, which was UK, and convinced them that there is a need for a national home or a Jewish state where it has to be near Jerusalem in the state of Palestine. Through the Balfour Declaration, UK actually said that we recognize or we will help Jews to get their state. After First World War, with the decline of Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire was divided into two. The northern parts were under France and the southern parts came under Britain. And the portion which is west of Jordan was actually present or was actually given to United Kingdom to look after, to administer. At this point of time, UK allowed the Jews to come and settle in this region. Arab people or Palestinian people were actually present in this region. And when more settlers came in, there was some sort of conflict between both. And the settlement was increasing. The conflict was also there. But once the Second World War started and Hitler's killing of Jews gave a lot of sympathy for Jews across the world. Right from United States, Soviet Union, France, UK, everyone supported Jews and the Jewish state. And they told in United Nations that the land which is to the west of Jordan River has to be divided into two portions. One will be Israel, another one will be Palestine. And this was voted by almost everyone. But at this point of time, the voting which took place in 1947, India was independent and India voted against it. I mean, India voted against it. The reason for this is India felt Israel is formed on the basis of religion. And if Israel is forming on the basis of religion, there is no difference between Israel and Pakistan. So we do not accept states formation on the basis of religion. So India did not support Israel. And over a period of time, there were several wars between the Arab countries and Israel. And the Israel strength has increased after every war. Because the dedicated army, weapons and the funding that they had, they could actually fight against all these Arab countries. India was conscious that we do not want to have any opinion or we do not want to be closer to Israel during this period. The reason was India was dependent on oil on Arab countries and if we support Israel, then these Arab countries may put sanctions on India. So one threat India had was with respect to oil. Second, with respect to Kashmir issue, Pakistan was trying to internationalize Kashmir issue as a Muslims issue. So Arab countries may support Pakistan when it comes to Kashmir. So we were aware of this fact also and we never wanted to have open and direct relationship with them. Mostly Nehru was associated with non-alignment movement and in non-alignment movement, Nehru was actually supporting the Palestinian cause and India was one of the first countries to recognize Palestinian state. Even the embassy of Palestine is there in India. During all this, India did not have any diplomatic communications with Israel much. 
later in 1992 for the first time India opened the diplomatic channel because we liberalized our economy we wanted to be pro United States as well because it was a unipolar world and we recognized Israel Nehru had once said in 1950 India formally recognized Israel 1992 we opened diplomatic communications with Israel in 1950 when Nehru recognized he openly said that Israel is a fact we could have accepted it before but we did not want to hurt the sentiments of Arab people that is the reason we did not recognize but 1992 India became more realistic and it wanted to have relations with almost all the countries at that point of time we opened a diplomatic channel even before this, when we were talking with Israel, we did not allow the embassy of Israel to be opened in Delhi because we were skeptic that the Arab countries may feel bad. The embassy was in Mumbai initially. And later, it is believed that Israel had helped India in times of crisis, especially when Kargil was being fought. India did not have clear information about what was happening in Kargil. We did not have the GPS access to see how many people are there, what should be our strategy and all. It is believed that US and other forces were not ready to give us weapons in that short notice. And Israel provided all these information and also equipments at short notice. After this, we usually see India's relationship with Israel has actually increased or improved. And here you should be aware that Israel has its own speciality when it comes to defense technology. Israel's defense technology is more defensive in nature because it has to protect its territory from Palestinian Liberation Organization, Hamas and other Arab countries as well. So it focused more on developing defensive technology. Whereas most of the equipments that we purchase from Russia or United States is usually offensive technology. So with both these playing an important role, you might be aware that India's nuclear doctrine actually focuses on no first use policy. And in that no first use policy, India says we need to protect our territory against others because we are not going to use weapons for the first time. So we should have the defensive technologies that is required as well. So India is relying on Israel for this. And why does Israel love India or why does Israel want India? If you ask this a simple question is, India is recognized globally for its peace and its thinking with respect to certain issues are being respected by the world community. India was the first country to recognize Palestine. And if India supports Israel, then the legitimacy of Israel improves. Economically, when we talk, Israel doesn't have much industries which can export huge amounts and it cannot grow economically much. Raw materials are also very limited. At this point of time, defense is one of the major source of income and it exports almost around 41% of Israel's arms. So from this point of view, economy point of view, India is very important for Israel. And India and Israel both are fighting together against terrorism. And Israel's spy agencies and their support is very, very important for India to deal in Middle East and other places where our diaspora is also significantly present. And the most important thing we all have to look at is the agriculture. When we actually observe Israel, you usually observe that there is a Dead Sea and it is arid or semi-arid region. Israel mostly is arid or semi-arid region. Its climatic conditions and soil conditions are similar to Gujarat and Rajasthan. They have ensured that 
even in this harsh climatic conditions, by best technologies, they can grow good crops. India has an ambitious policy of per drop more crop and Israel's agricultural policies and its technology will help India in horticulture mechanization, protected cultivation, orchard and canopy management, nursery management, micro irrigation, post harvest management, all these factors. So Israel is very important for India from agriculture point of view as well. Next important thing is actually with respect to water management. When you are talking about arid and semi-arid climate, obviously the water management is very very essential and in India some areas you have enough water resources where flooding takes place and mostly as we are dependent on monsoons and during El Nino or other years, it is important to ensure water management takes place properly. Example last year. From all this point of view, relationship with Israel is important. Next, I have already spoken about trade. India exports petroleum and other products to Israel. And from diaspora point of view, there are very less relationship. But at last, some of the recent MOU signed is given. It is more or less the same. But the diplomat, Israeli diplomat, when he was talking, he said that, what can India learn from Israel? He said that Israel has very good farm to university connect and university to farm connect. That is, whenever there is any problems in the farm, they usually intimate it to the universities and universities come up with innovative measures to solve the issues. And if universities find anything, they actually link it with the farms so that the farmers will be benefited. So this innovation has actually strengthened the technology of Israel. This is what India also have to learn. Then from urban planning point of view, there is an issue where we see that one of the major problem associated with urban development is there are several departments which are working simultaneously but each department is not cooperating with the other department and everyone have their own zones electricity works separately water works separately when all these departments are working separately when there is any common problem they are not able to coordinate with each other so that they can come out effectively with solutions which may help each one to work towards it. For example, just take if there is a sewage issue and suddenly if they break a water pipe or so, then again you have to bring in the water coordination team and that department you have to approach, they will come, they will look into the issue. So when everyone works separately, there is a problem. And even for example, you take, you want to go for cables, you want to go for some sort of like, you know, sewage, water tanks and other facilities being provided. Everyone keeps digging the roads again and again. So without knowing what the other department wants to do. So the PWD ministry will give permission to go for road connectivity or road improvements and after one month or two month the sewage or the water plants will come and they will keep digging it you can see this sort of like you know improper coordination between different departments so if india is planning for smart cities we need to ensure that these lines are being better drawn so that coordination between different departments happens properly. So to give an example, we have taken NMDC that is Municipal Corporation of Delhi where you have multiple departments and this is the reason why there is blame game that it has to be done by municipality, it has to be done by state government, it has to be done by central government. No one is actually willing to take the responsibility. 
At last, when we look at the Singapore model, we see that they have created the city into zones and they have a common blueprint which every department has to follow. This has helped Singapore to maintain its cities and if India wants to aim at these type of smart cities, then India also have to look at the governance issues. Right? So this is what we need to focus about the urban development as well. The next important issue is Prime Minister Modi's visit to Germany to attend G20. And you have seen India has brought terrorism to the focus. And it has clearly said that countries whichever support terrorism should be removed from G20. A financial action task force has to work effectively to ensure that terror financing is reduced. Deterrent action against nations supporting terrorism should be made compulsory. Legal processes such as extradition has to be made simpler. And a comprehensive convention on international terrorism which India is stressing must be adopted soon because the definition of terrorism or who exactly can be called as terrorists, this is not clear. Weapons and Explosive Action Task Force should be constituted just to ensure that as black money or money terror financing happens, we should also ensure that the weapons are not going into the hands of these terrorists and whoever helps them, there should be a check on that as well. And cyber security is one of the major area where terrorists are usually using this not only for recruitment, but also for procurement and also for financing. So it is important for us to look at all these issues together, right? G20, they may ask you or terrorism, they may ask you, how can the international community come together to ensure that terrorism can be successfully eliminated? So for this, these points, if you can write, it would be helpful, right? From the prelims point of view, you have to remember the G20 countries through maps. I'll help you to remember all these 20 countries. The border dispute between Bhutan and China has continued and India's help to Bhutan has continued. I have already told you the importance of Doklam Plateau, which is closer to the Siliguri Corridor. So India is worried about it. And the most important thing we need to remember here is that immediately after China or Mao came to power in China and attacked Tibet, Bhutan and Nepal were afraid of China and they signed treaty of friendship with India. And recently, the Indo-Bhutan friendship treaty was revisited. Earlier we said that India will guide Bhutan's foreign policy. Now we have accepted that India will not interfere in the sovereign rights of Bhutan. But Bhutan has also ensured that it has not allowed any of the P5 country to open its embassy in Bhutan so that it will not hurt Indian sentiments. And Bhutan and India has agreed that each other's territory will not be used and no action will be taken which may affect other country. So we can trust Bhutan in this that they will never give the Doklam area which is a cause of concern for India. This is the most important point that we have to notice when we are actually talking about this. Indirectly, it is believed that India has taken or India has agreed that it will defend Bhutanese territory and now to defend Bhutanese territory, Indian army is present there. And recently, the parliamentarians have said that we need to improve the border roads so that in case of war, we are in a position to fight effectively. But when we talk from India and Bhutan point of view, Indian military training team is present in Bhutan, which is involved in training Bhutan army as well. And whenever it is associated with border talks, it is believed that India guides Bhutan, especially when it wants to talk with China, because India is aware how China usually deals with its neighboring countries. 
So these are some of the things we need to focus when it comes to India, Bhutan specifically. Then the Supreme Court has told Tamil Nadu government to prevent farm suicides and farm suicides is one of the major issues. So we have tried to give you some of the factual information associated with farm suicides farmer suicides which may be helpful for you to write essay or even answers just go through this this is just factual information and at last an important factual information for prelims first maize based mega food park is being set up in Kapartula, Punjab so just go through this once it should be enough right so guys, all these informations are very, very important for you from both prelims and mains point of view. So please go through this quickly. And at last, ethics questions, you can see. We are planning to launch the NCRT based geography preparation for prelims 2018. And we'll be also coming up with internal security and international relations. Once the prelims result comes, we will be launching those videos quickly for a simple reason that even we need to ensure that most of the topics which are covered in international relations and internal security will be asked in exam. And when we look at the trend, we usually observe that it is June, July, August. Earlier when the exam was in December, now it may be from April, May, June, July. Issues which were in news is very, very important from Maine's point of view. So by the time prelims result comes, we hope most of the important areas will be covered. Then it will be easy for us to cover international relations and internal security from this year point of view as well. Right? So guys, thank you. Thanks for watching.